Good morning. How are y'all doing? Let's stand together and get ready for worship. We are so excited to have you here today. Master's Sunday. We're excited to be here in worship. Let's sing together. Let's get our hands together this morning, y'all. Come on, let's go. Woo! All right, all right. Hey, hey. Sing this for me, sing. Let everything, come on. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing it again, come on. Let everything. That has breath. Praise the Lord. Come on. Yeah. I'm praising the valley. You guys can have a quick seat. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Wesley. My name is Michaela, and I am so glad you're here. I serve as the Director of Student Discipleship here at Wesley, um, and I have a couple of announcements for you. 
Um, as you know, we have our Connect card here. We would love it if you would fill it out just so that we can stay connected with you, know about your prayer concerns um, and anything else you might need. And since we have that fun little tournament happening down the road, we thought that this morning, the question of the day here at the bottom, you could let us know what player you think is gonna win. Or if you don't know any players' names like I do, then you can tell us what your favorite master snack is. So once you finish filling that out, we would love to know your answer. A couple more announcements. On April 28th, we have Membership Sunday, and that is gonna be a really special day. Um, of course, you can join our church any Sunday that you want, but we wanted to set aside a special Sunday so that we can really, as a congregation, focus on what it means to be in community with one another and in fellowship as well. We also wanted to go over, um, on May 2nd, we have our second annual prayer breakfast, and that is gonna be a really special morning. You know that if it is that early and I'm still that excited for it, it is good. So we hope that you'll join us that day um, so that we can start our day off uh, with prayer on the National Day of Prayer. Um, let's continue in worship together. Thank you. Amen. Before we start worship, if you would stand with us and I'm gonna pray. God, I thank you for your presence with us here this morning. We thank you for each and every one of these hearts and the families and the homes that they represent. And God, I thank you that you truly are able to do anything. Nothing is impossible for you. And in the moments of our lives when we have hopeless situations, you are still the one who can when there seems to be no way. We thank you for that and thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. The man's empty praise and treasures the fade. Today, today. 
believe that this morning that we serve a God that can do impossible things he can turn a sea turn it into a highway to free his people so if you're waiting for a miracle if there's like a sticking point in your life right now we're gonna sing this song out it's just a testament of faith that we believe that God still does impossible things sing this with us this morning I gotta catch my breath I'll tell you <laughs> maybe you could do that for me this morning
this morning. You guys can have a seat. Thank y'all so much for singing with us. Good morning again. Thank you for being here in worship with us this morning. And we have worshiped now with song and we'll worship in just a little bit with the proclamation of the word. And now we've reached the time where we worship with our giving. There are a variety of ways to engage in giving at our church. There's traditional ways where we'll pass the baskets here in just a minute with our welcome team, uh, but you can also give online uh, and through a variety of ways. If you have questions about those, please come find one of us and we can help you help you do that. Um, and for now, uh, we'll pray, we'll give our offering, and we'll continue in worship together. I'm going to ask the welcome team to come forward as I pray over and for our offering this morning. God, thank you for the gift of worship to be able to come and to worship together as a church family, to lift your name, Lord, to hear your word, and now to give. Bless our tithes and our gifts and our offerings as we offer them to you, Lord, with no strings attached, so that you might make yourself known among your people. Be with us as we worship in this particular way. We ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name.
good morning. Grateful and glad that you are here this morning. I'm Greg, uh, also known on the church staff as the old guy, and uh, glad that you were here to be a part of this. You know, they don't let me preach over in modern. They only let me come on the high, big attendance Sundays, they tell me. So I'm really glad that they gave me this prime spot when all of the world is looking about 10 miles down south on Washington Road, but grateful and glad that you were here, and I'm glad to be able to share the message. Also wanted to let you know, I already know, I don't know if you've selected, so you can still amend your answers to Michaela's questions. What is, who is going to win? That's no problem whatsoever. You heard it here first. Scotty Scheffler will prevail for his second green jacket unless his wife has a baby, in which case he's going to leave at the 15th hole and head out as he should. Anybody who's got his priorities right is also somebody that I would back. I would just remind you. And then the second thing, of course, it's the pimento cheese that you want for the snack. Okay, did I get it right or not on the answers? Thank you very much. Now, uh, second thing I do want to say in a more serious way, uh, because the church ought to address things like this. And as soon as the tournament was over and I had turned over the TV from the spectacle that we watched, there were the bombs that were coming in as of Israel. Almost a thousand, either in terms of just that which went over or scud missiles or one thing or another armament raining down on Israel. And I was fascinated because both sides claim victory. Iran said it's the first time that anyone, another nation, has had the courage to rain armament on Israel. Israel said we were successful. A thousand projectiles meant for destruction were knocked down out of the sky. 99%. And I'm here to tell you, both sides are wrong. Because when one side can say and claim victory over another, the only thing I am certain of is that there are tears that fall from heaven. For until we understand that until every knee shall bow and profess him as Lord and Savior, we are not yet as God intends us to be. We are God's creation. And we will only realize that when we start behaving as such. Not seeking our destruction, but only our edification and realizing that God's vision is for all people, for all are the work of his hand. Would you pray with me? Oh God, in a time of spring when we think of beauty and and we profess the imagination of what new life alone can do. We give thanks. And we pray this day that we also set aside division and set aside its armament of destruction. This gets us no closer to your intention of your creation. This provides no avenue where we can come and be together. And we pray and mourn and also point out the fiction that victory can be won over another when it is only realized in our relationship to you. This is the highest desire of our heart. This when it is realized, is heaven come to earth. Come, Lord Jesus. Come to every place of every need.
come to us this morning, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for letting me have just a bit of a side as I thought about yesterday and stayed up late into the night and watching it all and then arriving early this morning to read, now it's done. It's not done. It'll never be done until we understand God doesn't choose sides. We are all of his creation. And this is the reflection that is to be the witness of our life. Well, with that in mind, I did want to read for you the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel lesson for this morning. It is Jesus, and he is appearing again to his disciples. It's the third time in the narrative that is the Gospel of Luke that Jesus has appeared to his disciples. The first time there is that long, long walk on the day of his rising seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven-mile journey, seven miles. They're walking with Jesus, and they do not even know him. And then, as he has the meal, following the meal, then there is in the 34th verse, again of the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, that Jesus has also appeared to Peter. Now, for the third time, Jesus appears. Would you hear this reading of God's good news that is recorded this way, beginning in this 36th verse? And while they were still talking about all that Jesus had done, Jesus himself stood among the disciples, and he said to the disciples, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, and they thought they saw a ghost. And so Jesus said again to them, why are you troubled? And why do you doubt? And why is it still in your mind? Look at my hands. See my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. And then after he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe, it is because of joy and amazement he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I have told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that was written in the law of Moses and of the prophets and of the Psalms. And then he opened their minds to that they could understand the scriptures, and he told them, this is what is written, that Christ would suffer, and then on the third day rise from the dead, and repentance and forgiveness of sins would need to be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. I am going, therefore, to send you what my Father has promised. Stay now in the city until you've been clothed with the power that can come only from on high. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is, as I said before, the third resurrection appearance of Jesus. You'd think they'd get it, don't you? I mean, seven miles walking along. You think about how long it takes you to walk seven miles. And we're not talking about pavement. We're talking about rocky roads. We're talking about late in the afternoon. All of your energy is spent. Everything is a day's just seven lonely long miles. When you think everything that you'd hoped for has now been taken from you. Seven, seven miles. What is it? An hour, two hours, maybe even more just walking, not really even walking, plodding, 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 head down, looking at the tops of your feet, looking for the next stone, imagining something else. What else could go wrong? They're talking among themselves. And Jesus is with them, and they do not even recognize it. Because you and I know, and something that faith tries to teach and we continue to reject, 
as less reliable is that eyewitness is the least witness that there is. In a court of law, it's the last thing that is used to be able to convict someone else because as an eyewitness, we tend to see as we want to see, not necessarily as things as they actually are. And everything we see, we interpret through our minds and through past experiences. I remember one time, this is years ago, it was when they were constructing I-400, you know, the 400 out in North Atlanta. You go straight up, there was a meeting. I was with a couple other folk. They happened to be African-American folk. We were going to a church meeting, all three of us together. I still remember Martha Randall, one of the folk that was driving the car, and they were putting up the barriers up against 400 because, you know, they had to go right through North Atlanta and neighborhoods were demolished and they had to put up the barriers along either side of the interstate. And I, I looked at the barriers and, and, and somebody else in the car said, what are they putting up those for? The road's done. They don't need to put up these big walls. And I said, it's to keep out the sound. And Martha said, it's so they don't have to see folk like us in North Atlanta. I did not think audibly at that moment that they were trying to keep out a part of the populace from others, and this was a barrier. I just understood it, that it was a sound barrier, but I understood it from my perspective. She understood it from hers. We both saw the same thing, and we both interpreted it differently. The least reliable evidence that is allowed in a court of law is the eyewitness, because it's not simply that you report what you see, but you report unconsciously what you believe. And what you believe sometimes changes what people think they see. When Je they, Jesus walked with the disciples for seven miles, but they didn't see him, even though they saw him. So Jesus was at a problem. How in the world am I to convey that this really matters? How is it that I am to convey that I am risen? If, if, I, if it's not with their eyes, maybe I will show them with my hands. I want you to take out your hands. Look at your hands for a second. Would you do it? Do you realize your hands are the most authentic expression of you? I can remember when I would take our kids on a trip and they'd get on each other's nerves and I would have to stop the car and I would explain to them, we're going on a trip, we're having a good time. Aren't we having a good time? And if you don't think we're having a good time, I'm going to spank you until you do. And I would say, I want you to smile. And they would smile. You know, it's like when they get a picture and they tell you to photograph and, and smile and you're supposed to smile. You can always tell it's fake. Your face is the least way in which you identify yourself. You can crunch and wrinkle it up in any variety of expressions that can mislead how it is that you really are and feel. But your hands, they give you away. They show what it is that you do. I ride with a trainer, a horse trainer, Saturday morning yesterday with the dog out of the way. It was a beautiful morning to go on a ride. The dog jumps into the ponds. I go on the ride. I saw a wild turkey on one end. I saw, of course, 
a group of deer that were coming through. It was a beautiful ride in the morning on a Saturday morning in spring. It was just gorgeous. I ride with a trainer. My hands, you can tell I'm a preacher. They don't do much. His hands are callous and rough from tossing hay bales, from working with animals. And they're thicker and stronger and calloused. You know what he does? Because you can see his hands. And if you ever shake him, then you know. Jesus said, see my hands, because the hands are the description of who you are. They're also the most vulnerable part of you. When I first learned to ride a horse, and the first thing I did before I rode a horse was I had to learn how to catch up the horse. I had to learn how to walk with the horse. You rock always to its shoulder, never out in front. That's where you have least control. It's only at the shoulder where you have control of a horse because you can turn it around and around. It's a thousand pound animal, face to face, pound for pound. You're going to lose any kind of disagreement that you have. But you have the shoulder and you have leverage around them. And I can remember when I grabbed the lead line to do it and I wrapped it securely around my hand and the trainer said, don't do that. I said, what do you mean don't do that? He said, never wrap a lead line around your hand because if you do and the horse bolts off, your fingers are going to go with it. Thousand pounds or dragging you behind. Never wrap it around and wrap it around your hand. Hold it loose so that you can let it go if it flees from you. I've never forgotten that first instruction. Before I learned how to saddle, how to bridle the head here and all, I learned never wrap your hand around a lead line. It's the most vulnerable part of you. It's the most honest part of you. It's your hands. No cosmetic surgery. No lying about what you do with your time or your life. The calluses, the muscles of your hands tell you who you are in many times what it is that you do. I'll never forget this time when I was in Pendergrass, Georgia, served a little church, Holly Springs Methodist Church out in Pendergrass, Georgia. There was a one of my church members had a little country store, you know, just a little cinder block store, had a pot belly stove in the middle. That was the HVAC system of the store. And we would just come over there and sometimes I'd get a gallon of gas or I would get a Coca-Cola, and then we'd just sit and we'd talk. D. Marlowe was his name. Great guy. I, I love D. Marlowe and his wife named Frances. His daughter still calls me on my birthday. I've been gone from there 40 years. She still calls on my birthday. I love D. Marlowe. I remember one time I went in just to the store to see D. Marlowe, and apparently he just accidentally somehow put his hand into a shard of glass and it come right there in the middle. And I mean, it was just gushing, 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 all kinds of things. And I'll, he did something I'll never forget. He just pulled out that shard of glass and then he took his handkerchief from his back uh, overall pants and he just wrapped it tight like that and, and he just tied it off like that and, and blood gushing everywhere. And it was like, he just never, anything had happened. I can remember it. Well, I don't really remember it. But after they woke me up from passing out, from seeing it, they told me that's what happened. And I believe them. And I never forgot D. Marlowe. And that time when out of his hand, he just pulls a shard of glass and wraps it with his handkerchief. And you knew he was just salt of the earth, tough old guy that had seen a lot of life. It was all in his hands. You know, the, the 
expression shake on it? The way business used to be conducted? You reach out your hand. The other party reaches out there. You know why they came up with the term shake on it? Because you could make an agreement, and if you shook on it, you couldn't release yourself from the agreement because you were holding the other's hand. It was a way of saying, we are in this, and we can't dissolve it. Because we're holding on to one another. And he was shouldering his hands. It was a way of saying, I'm in this. He's showing the most honest part of himself. The scars. The blood still there, now dry, the wound exposed, the most vulnerable part of him was given to his disciples as a way of saying, we are in covenant together. And so I'm surprised that when he said, See my hands? According to the scripture now, Luke 24, this disciples still disbelieved. How in the world could they disbelieve that? They saw it with their own eyes. Remember what I said? Eyewitness is sometimes the least reliable judgment that we can make because some people saw the cross and the execution as a loss of God. And only others with belief in their heart were able to see what really transpired. That's the trouble with sin. It's interpreted not with our vision, but with our minds and influenced by our heart. So Jesus goes on to the next thing, which is the ironic thing. He says, do you have something to eat? And the disciples and Jesus eat together. Because eating too is a custom that tells more about you than whether you're hungry or satiated or not. Eating describes you. Did you know that? I still remember this. You know, some of you know my story. I grew up in Southern California, but my folks both had come from Arkansas and then had moved to Pasadena where dad had found a job there. And so we are in uh, Arkansas, we're in Pasadena and Southern California, uh, friends all in Southern California, and that was where we grew up, and I was raised and all of that. But Dad and Mom never forgot their rural roots in Arkansas. And I can remember one night I was playing with some friends, I don't know, probably seven or eight years old. It was time to go home for dinner, and we were just talking about what they were going to have for dinner. One of my friends was going to have spaghetti. Another one of my friends was going to have hamburgers and hot dogs and, I, you know, just all kinds of stuff like that. And then they asked, what are we going to have at our house? Well, Saturday night was Dad's meal. And so we only had Dad's favorite things to eat. We had hominy grits. That's the whole hominy. It's the whole kernel of the corn that's kind of been puffed up. It is tasteless. It has nothing to it, and he loved it. And then a slice of beefsteak tomato. He loved it. And then cornbread. Mom would make it every Saturday so he could have cornbread. And then he topped it off with buttermilk. 
which is still the worst thing that I could ever imagine anyone. If you want to torture somebody, just give them buttermilk and see what happens to it. He loved it. I explained what I had. My friends looked like I looked at me as though I had just stepped off of Mars. They said, what on earth are those? In? We've never even heard of those foods. We can't imagine those foods. But that's who he was. What we eat describes who we are. Jesus said you have something to eat because eating is an expression of community. It is something that you do seldom isolated, but always in the context of others. You remember, I still remember, a student at Emory, and Anne invited me on Thanksgiving too far to go back home for only a five-day weekend. And so she said, why don't you come to my family's house for Thanksgiving in Warrington, Georgia? I can remember going. In Southern California, we'd come to Thanksgiving, and, you know, we were dressed up if they made us wear shoes to the table. But in her parents, yeah, her grandfather was a lawyer, her uncle was a lawyer, her brother was about to be a lawyer, all of them dressed in ties and sport coat or a suit. And here I am in flip-flops, thinking that I'm there. I dressed up, I have flip-flops on, you know, coming to Thanksgiving in Warrington, Georgia, I mean, it's a set-out meal, lots of courses. I didn't know what you use all those forks for, and all that stuff is there, and I'm just having this time, and I'm trying just to behave. I realize I am way, way, way out of my element, and I'm just trying to get through the experience of the meal. When it's finally over, I'm sitting on their front porch. It's by Warrington Methodist Church still. They had rocking chairs. I'm sitting in the rocking chair. I'm just sort of pulling at my collar. I'm just trying to survive the experience. And my future father-in-law says, Greg, don't worry about it. In 40 or 50 years, you're going to feel just like one of them. Well, it took about 50 years. So at any rate, that's the way it is. Meal. The first meal that you have with somebody you know is significant, my guess is, each one of you can imagine that first meal, that particular place, the setting that was there, the things that were set before you, but mostly the company you were in. I wonder what the disciples thought on that meal with Jesus announcing himself and asking them, for something to eat. I'm present. I'm here with you. I'm sustained as you were sustained. At this table, not so much the food that is before us, but the company that surrounds us. Because a meal is already always more than a meal. There's this rabbinic story that goes like this. In the 1800s, there was a factory that made matzah, that is flatbread, the, you know, the, the bread that they use on the sacramental meals of the Jewish people. And it was a new factory that was going to create this matzah so that it could be sold around the community and throughout the region. And they wanted it certified as kosher, which meant that the rabbi has to come to the factory. The rabbi has to inspect all of the groups of food that will be used to create the product that is the bread. He then inspects the factory to make sure it's clean. Did you know in a factory that you have to have two sinks for two different kinds of preparation of foods for in a kosher kitchen inquires two sinks? And so the, the rabbi's going around. It takes him all morning long. He looks at each one of the ingredients 
from the salt to the peppers to the meal to all that will make the matzah so that it can be certified kosher. He looks through all of the preparation. Everything is as it's supposed to be. He then inspects the factory to make sure it is not contaminated. Any contamination means the factory and its product is not kosher. It does not receive his seal. It does not receive his blessing. It can't be described as for the people of God, representing the people of God. Finally, it's all done. All of the food is checked out. All of the factory floor is clean. Everything is met to standard. And so the owner of the factory comes to the rabbi and said, will you give us your seal? Will you tell us we have received the product? He says, I will not. They said, what do you mean? We've done everything we're supposed to do according to the law. All of the ingredients are according to the law. The rabbi said, that's right. They said, the factory is according to the law. See the sinks. See the cleanliness. It's according to the law. And the rabbi said, that's right. They said, then what's wrong? Why will you not say it's kosher? He said, because when I got here this morning, I heard you yelling at your employees, telling them the rabbi is supposed to come. You better behave or I will fire you. And that is not becoming of the people of God. Your factory isn't kosher until you behave as you believe. A meal is not simply the mixture of the ingredients. It is the expression that we are all in this, at this table together. And until we see that, we haven't seen Jesus. Jesus is risen. Of that, there is no doubt. So what is stopping his kingdom from coming on earth? Maybe there's more to this story. By partaking around the table and acknowledging him and him alone as our Lord and our source of salvation. Pray with me, would you? Oh God, we gather this day and we gather not for individual need, but we gather because our primary purpose is to serve as witness to his coming again. May we proclaim it, not simply in what we do, not simply in what we say, but in who we are. And when we do, his arrival will surely be near. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for our final song together?
But it is not simply that we know you, but we have arrived here so that we might experience you. So that what we observe becomes who we are. That what we believe is how we live. And so in seeing us, they might see you living in us. Come, Lord Jesus, and guide our life 
this day and evermore. Amen.